In 2017, the internet quietly split into two distinct blocks. The first block, led by China, would become dominated by so-called super apps or everything apps. Apps that were packed so full of features that they aimed to replace most, if not all, of your apps in a single package. From WeChat to Alipay, Grab to Gojek, Paytm to Line and more, each market would grow local champions that would take over whole industries. China's WeChat grew to have well over a billion users, of which almost a billion use it as an actual super app, regularly ordering takeout, buying train tickets, booking taxis and so on via the app, while Indonesia's GoTo group, for example, claims that transactions over its platform account for around 2% of their home country's GDP. These apps absolutely rule over many of their countries, especially in Asia, and their users often rave about the incredible conveniences that they offer. But meanwhile, in the second block, that includes Western countries and most of the rest of the world, the super app model just hasn't worked at all. Everyone from Meta to Uber and even Snapchat have set building a super app as their official strategy at one point, but they have all failed so far, so it's extra curious that Elon Musk announced that he will now try again. Twitter has just been renamed to X to signify this, and Elon Musk even declared in an interview recently that he thinks that X could take over half of the world's entire financial system if it was turned into a super app. Become, I don't know, maybe half of the global financial system. That is ridiculously ambitious. That would make X by far Elon's biggest business yet. So why did super apps work in some countries? Why didn't they work in others? And can X finally do what all the others have failed to do here in the West? Let's find out. This video was sponsored by our streaming service, Nebula. In January of 2014, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba and Alipay, declared that his company had been brutally attacked, calling it his Pearl Harbor moment. The aggressor shaking his empire to its core was WeChat, the leading Chinese messaging and social media app, which back then launched so-called digital rat packets. In China, it is customary around Lunar New Year for people to gift each other cash in little red paper packets. And WeChat, which had just launched a mobile wallet, a few months earlier figured out that it could digitize this process. Instead of paper packets with paper cash, people could message each other animated stickers that carried digital cash. 40 million red packets were sent just over the holidays alone, meaning that almost overnight, tens of millions of consumers activated their WeChat wallets and connected their bank accounts to them so they could withdraw their gifts or send new ones. This brilliant move meant that Jack Ma's Alipay, the dominant mobile wallet until then, suddenly got a serious competitor. And this new competitor then went off and started the super app age in China. WeChat had just successfully combined payments and instant messaging into a single app, two things that were previously completely separate things. And since that match worked out great, they quickly asked themselves, why not add more? So they first built a bunch of things to pay for. These included letting people top up their phone bills, pay for utilities, buy rail and flight tickets, etc. right from the app. But then in 2017, they made their really big move when they officially launched their so-called mini programs. These are basically third-party apps that users could download and open inside the WeChat app, and they were an incredible success right from the start. A simple game called Tiao Tiao apparently got over 400 million players in its first three days, and soon every organization that you can think of launched a mini program, from international brands like McDonald's to KFC, Sands Club to Walmart, etc., to local companies, of course, and public transport agencies, etc. There are now at least 4.3 million mini programs on WeChat alone, which is more than the number of apps that are on Apple's or Google's app stores, and on WeChat alone, mini programs now get 928 million active users every month. That is almost every adult in China. A Chinese user could now theoretically live their entire online digital life only within WeChat. Of course, other apps like Alipay fought back and quickly replicated the WeChat super app model to the point where Jack Ma's darling is arguably even more successful these days than WeChat is. Beside that, new domestic super apps like Meituan emerged to add to the competition, while a bunch of international companies replicated 
replicated the model of the super apps abroad too. Jamming many different services and features into a single app became basically the default way to become the leading app in many countries, especially across South and Southeast Asia. In fact, this model is so ubiquitous by now that companies like Alipay have whole software developer kits and step-by-step -step guides to let any company use their tech to build super apps, and companies like Ali Cloud have dedicated cloud service solutions tailor-made to hosting a super app for anyone who wants to build one. The tech itself is literally an off-the-shelf commodity by now. And yet, in many countries around the world, super apps never really took off, and if anything, in the West it is quite common for an app maker to actually split off a feature into another app if it becomes successful so it can be focused on. Facebook famously separated messaging out of its core social media app. Google at some point split its messaging and video calling features into five different apps, each with a slightly different set of features. Uber has long offered its ride hailing and its food ordering services in two separate apps for users who want it, and the list goes on. Meanwhile, attempts at building a Western super app have failed. Snapchat went all in on becoming a super app around 2020 as it launched Snap Cash for mobile payments and as it allowed users to play games and to open third-party apps within Snapchat with a platform called Minis. They completely copied the WeChat model and Tencent, the company that actually makes WeChat, even bought a 12% stake in the company. But none of it worked and they just gave up. Meanwhile, other attempts such as Facebook adding payments into Messenger or adding shopping into Instagram or trying to turn WhatsApp into a super app in a few markets like India have seen mediocre success at best. So why did this model fail here and what are Elon's chances to succeed regardless? And to answer that, we first have to define what a super app is because there's roughly three different things that people call super apps that if you look a little bit closer are actually quite different. First is what I would call the true super app, of which only two have ever succeeded, WeChat and Alipay. Only these two have a true open third-party ecosystem of downloadable mini programs. Fun fact, these mini programs, by the way, are really just optimized websites that open within the main app, of course, but they are pretty cool because as a user, you can often place orders and everything with them instantly right away without having to sign up for an account or add payment methods or anything because those often get taken from the parent app. Anyway, the big two are the only true super apps by this definition, and I think the reason why nobody has successfully cloned them yet is because this model doesn't really make sense outside of China. China is a majority Android market, but one that uniquely does not have Google's centralized control over it. There is no Play Store for apps, no Google account that you log into as soon as you switch phones that acts as your identity, there is no Google Pay for payments, etc. Instead, each phone brand puts whatever services and accounts they want onto their phones. This incredible vacuum left room for a centralized platform to exist that ran across all phone brands in the country, and that platform ended up being WeChat and Alipay. These two apps were installed on everyone's phones already, so they evolved into acting like operating systems, taking the place of Google and Apple services. The rest of the world just doesn't have this problem, so I think replicating the whole app store model outside of China, well, that's just going to be very unlikely. Okay, and then super app model number two is what I would call the local services model. And Singapore's Grab, Indonesia's Gojek, and China's Meituan are probably the three best examples of this. On Grab, for example, you can book a Grab taxi, or you can get a Grab driver to bring you food, groceries, flowers, medicine, etc. These are typically physical services provided by the company and its affiliates directly, so as a business, these are more similar to an Uber than they are to a WeChat. Now, Western alternatives of these do kind of exist, like Glovo and Postmates that offer to deliver just about anything from the home, but the problem is that of the hundreds of local services that a company could offer, ride-sharing and food delivery are by far the biggest businesses, and so the Ubers of the world really can't be bothered to focus on any of the other stuff. In countries where labor is cheap and density is high, especially in the cities, it might make sense for a company to offer multiple local services to its customers, but in other countries like the US, most of those services just don't make a whole lot of business sense. Okay, and the third super app model is what I will call the payments app, and I think this is best exemplified by India's Paytm. Paytm is a digital wallet, much like PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App, except it is built on India's national payment standard called UPI, and on top of peer-to-peer -peer transactions, Paytm also built out other things to pay for straight from the app. Public transport tickets, movie tickets, utilities, etc. There are a ton of companies whose services Paytm has built an integration for. So this is basically the same model as 
WeChat and Alipay, except without a real third-party app store. And given that Elon has specifically said that his goal is to become the WeChat outside of China, and given that he said that his app is going to take over half the financial system, I think it's pretty safe to assume that this payments model is what he wants X to focus on. Elon was famously briefly the CEO of PayPal and his own firm called X.com when he was still just a balding man like me, so technically speaking, he has more experience running a payments company than he has a social media business. So can he make this work? Well, I think I can see a sort of strategy that he's trying to employ, but I also think it's going to be incredibly difficult to actually implement. All of the successful wallets out there are built around a frequent core payments use case, ideally something defensible. WeChat, for example, built its mobile wallet first on peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Users already had all their contacts in the app, so just sending money to literally anyone that they knew in a chat became the foundation for the wallet. Alipay, meanwhile, built their service on the back of the fact that their parent company, Alibaba, operates all the big e-commerce stores in the country like Taobao, Tmall, and more. They're basically the Amazon of China, but on steroids, and those stores only accepted Alipay, which then, in turn, formed its strong foundation. Meanwhile, Paytm, WeChat, and Alipay all focus on in-person payments as well. Users in China and India typically didn't have credit cards at the time, and Google and Apple Pay weren't widespread either, so mobile wallets that let users scan QR codes and such became the default way to pay in person. Peer-to-peer -peer transactions, plus buying things online and offline, are like the three most common type of payments out there, and these served as the core of these apps, and then all the other, less common transaction types were just sprinkled over these foundations. But Twitter has a tiny user base compared to that of WeChat and people don't typically follow their friends on the platform. Elon Musk doesn't own Amazon, at least for now, I guess, and most countries also have convenient offline payment solutions already, so none of these are real options. Instead, I think Elon is trying to create a core payments use case for X within the app itself. With paid subscriptions to X Blue, users paying for exclusive content and creators receiving payouts from an advertising revenue share model, etc., Elon seems hell-bent on adding transactions to everything in the app, which I think is intended to form the seed of a core payments use case. Of course, the problem is that the adoption of all these paid features has been pretty unimpressive so far. Only about 640,000 people have reportedly signed up for Blue in the first half a year or so, and churn rates are reportedly horrifyingly bad so far, with more than half of the early Blue subscribers having quit already. And then convincing Blue users to start using their social media app for payments will be a whole other challenge. So I think Elon's plan is to kind of growth hack all of these payment options within the app itself to a meaningful degree, and then to leverage that to create a sort of core payment use case out of that and to build a mobile wallet on top of that. Theoretically, that's possible, but they're still pretty far away from that. There's also the idea floating around online about Elon trying to turn Twitter into an investment platform, a la Robin Hood, which might be a good idea, as social trading is kind of a phenomenon, but details on this are vague, plus that's hardly what WeChat does, so I'll skip this possibility for now. And until that kicks into gear, I think the only option that is left is to build a wallet for relatively low-frequency payments like flights and movies and utility bills and whatnot, all of which would rely on other companies on the back end for integrations, much like Paytm has done it with their app. And I guess that could become convenient, but it's partly the reimagination of the entire financial system, and I'm not sure if it is worth ruining Twitter over, potentially. Because all the while, the core social media business of X is on fire. It has lost 50% of its advertising revenues, it is bleeding cash, and everyone from Threads to TikTok is cloning it, which has created the first direct competition that the app has had in a decade. Now, I don't think an app the size of Twitter will just disappear overnight, but diverting resources from this to building a payments app instead? Well, that seems like a massive risk. X only has 1,300 employees after X fired 80% of the company, while Paytm, for example, has 15,000 focusing only on payments only in a single country. Building out all the integrations and dealing with compliance and fraud and everything is a huge workload for any company, and I'm just not convinced that Twitter is in the position to just give away all these resources so that they can focus on that instead of the core business. I mean, while creating a bunch of payment features and kind of jamming them into the core social media app might actually make the social media app worse because of the whole bloat that this adds. 
Remember, Western consumers have historically shown a preference for focused apps, which only do a few things but do those really well, so these integrations risk annoying people who, you know, just want to tweet. Now, I don't think a Western super app is inherently a bad idea, and maybe Elon Musk is even the person to do it, because he kind of warps reality around him, so many things can happen there. But I do think it is going to be an incredible challenge, and I'm just not convinced why Twitter has to be a part of this at all. As Bloomberg's Matt Levine wrote, Musk didn't want Twitter for its employees, whom he fired, or its code, which he trashes regularly, or its brand, which he abandoned, or its most dedicated users, whom he is working to drive away. So he didn't really want Twitter in the first place, and as I've just explained, there's not a whole lot of overlap between Twitter and the payments app anyway, so just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, just to illustrate a point, imagine that Elon Musk actually took the $44 billion that he spent on Twitter, and instead he built a payment app with that from scratch. Here's a silly calculation for that. Say he hires an insane 10,000 employees from day one, and he pays them an average salary of 200,000 US dollars each. That is only $2 billion for a year. Then throw in the cost of, I don't know, servers and rent and bribing officials and whatever else you want, and voila. Surely you have been able to develop a solid payments app for $4 billion in a year. Now he still has a pretty crazy $40 billion that he can spend, and by the way, fun fact, he doesn't have to deal with a social media app on the side that is still losing money for him every month. So he can just buy users now. For example, he could give the first 40 million people who connect their bank accounts and get three friends to sign up $1,000 each to spend via his app. And that's it. He has a fully featured payments app with 120 million accounts created right out of the gate. Now, obviously, this is a wildly oversimplified scenario, but I do think that it shows how absurdly large some of these sums are and just how convoluted a path Elon has chosen to take for this supposed goal. Never say never, especially with Elon, but from what I can see so far, there were probably many better ways to attempt building a super app than by trying to contort Twitter into becoming one. Anyway, while I do have my doubts, I love watching people like Elon who are trying to build completely improbable things against all odds, and actually my favorite types of content are sort of like documentaries about people who are trying to do the unthinkable like this. And now, this is obviously on a different scale, but if you do enjoy these stories of struggle as much as I do, then I genuinely cannot recommend a series called The Red Atoms enough. Red Atoms is a documentary series following the process of the Soviet Union struggling to build its nuclear program from scratch against a lot of adversity, and the storytelling and the production quality make this one of the best things that I've seen online in a long time. You can watch this series right now on Nebula, it is made by my fellow creators behind the Real Time History channel, and if you like thoughtful creators exploring how the world works in general, then Nebula as a whole will be a veritable goldmine for you. From originals like Wendover's Logistics of X series, which is pretty perfect perfectly titled for this episode, I guess, to Becoming Human from Real Science, which illustrates the human evolution process in beautiful detail, the platform is full of exclusive gems. I have an eight-part Nebula original series called Technorama there as well, plus the platform features all of our regular videos ad-free and usually early access too. Nebula is like all your favorite educational creators, except with more content and with fewer distractions. And best of all, it is not funded by shady tracking or annoying ads or anything like that, but directly by people like you who subscribe. Your subscriptions directly fund all the extra content that, that we can make. If you use my link, which you can find in the description below or on screen, you can get a yearly subscription for just 30 bucks, which is a $20 discount versus using a generic link to sign up. So check it out. I really hope you enjoy all the stuff that we've been putting out there, and I'll see you in the next video.